what does it take to get ahead now? And uh, we thought it was interesting because we've got some data. First, let's talk a little bit about the backdrop here. What was some of the things that you discovered, Matt, in your research this week? Yeah, that we are right now experiencing the longest period in history where we haven't had an increase in, this is looking at the federal minimum wage, right? Yep. And it's inflation adjusting everything. So looking at kind of your purchasing power of what would minimum wage buy you back then, inflation adjusted to today. Okay. And so if you were to inflation adjust minimum wage, go back to 1968. So February of 1968, that's when we hit our peak, where the federal minimum wage would be about... Like max purchasing power yeah, relative max, to minimum yeah, wage. Exactly. Okay. That would be a little over $11. Okay, if it was adjusted to today. If it today. was adjusted to today. Which and, is, and federal minimum wage is lower than that. Right. Yeah, I think today we're like seven twenty-five right. or something. So and Of course, the question is, how many jobs are at the federal minimum wage these days? Like very, is, very few. Yeah, like does does that really exist? Is it a yeah. is it a relevant metric but anymore? But it's a baseline, I think, to look at where are we at as a percentage on what does today's dollars mean versus what did it mean prior? And we've experienced a really long skid. You know, that's 34% less than it was in 1968. Right. Now, for everybody listening, there are a couple things that we don't have the answer for yet, too, to consider. You know, one is how many states have a state minimum wage right, because that, here that, that Oregon, kind of renders yeah. federal uh, sort of, uh, you know, irrelevant. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, in Oregon, it's significantly more. It's higher in Portland than it is in the rest of the state. And, um, and I think there are some other implications to what right, is Right, because what we're not just mean. talking about federal minimum wage, right? We're looking at wages really on a broader spectrum and saying, if the minimum wage is tracking on this scale, what are the other wages tracking? And I think that's kind of some of the more in-depth statistics I want to look at in saying, how are wages keeping up with different things like productivity and you know, uh, this one of, is sticking in Matthew's craw, by the way. It is. This, this productivity thing. So just lay it out there because uh, I'm going to have fun punching holes in this. Okay. So since 1973 to 2013, so this is a little older data, right? So we've got a 10 year gap here to make this current. But between those years, productivity was up 74%, but the hourly compensation was only up 9%. So you are getting a lot more production from your employees, but the the hourly compensation didn't match that. You go backwards in time to 1948, run that to 1973, it was almost step for step matching each other. Productivity between those years, 1948 to 1973, up 96% on productivity, mm -hmm. and hourly compensation up 91%. percent mm hmm so what we witnessed was a huge gap after that 19, you know, the, the mid 1970s. We mm -hmm. watched wages not keep up with productivity. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's interesting when you start to really get into the numbers on this. Now, here's a fun fact. Okay. When did we go off the gold standard? Right about that time. 1971. Yeah. Right? I was noticing that and I wondered if there was a correlation. Well, here's another fun fact. Okay. What have we been doing fairly consistently post World War II and really specifically from the 70s forward? We've been importing a lot more, but we've had our manufacturing exported overseas, right? Made in China, the made trade in Taiwan. Balance made in China. really changed, is what you're saying. Right. Yeah. And so if you consider the fact that, uh, all of a sudden, we globalized the labor market. It changed the price of labor domestically relative to over the pond, if you will. Hmm. So you needed productivity to increase per worker because otherwise it became cost competitive to ship the jobs overseas and bring the product back completed. Right. Right. This is the Nike phenomenon. It drives everybody nuts that you know Nike has a bunch of their shoes made in Vietnam. Right. And then... Or at least I believe last time. Right, it was but Vietnam. would you pay three or well? Yeah, would you pay five, six, seven hundred dollars, or you know, you're still paying a lot, and Nike's making a real premium, right? They're they're paying much less than that to manufacture the shoe, but the argument is, well, why do they do that? Presumably because it's much cheaper to manufacture the shoes there than here in the United States. Right now, 
whether that's right, wrong, or otherwise, isn't the comment of the day. Nope. It is, what does that do to the cost of labor? Right. Right? Because you're now having to compete as a labor force across the pond. A lot more workers entered the workforce, too. Yeah, that's that's the, the larger issue here. See, I think that there's something else at play that if we could better understand this, and I say we, meaning if, if I was trying to teach more people about this, to understand how wealth gets created and how the middle class falls behind, right? I think if we could understand this better, it gives folks a more of a fighting chance at keeping up. Right, and I think that's really the goal. We're trying to empower people. How do you get ahead? Yeah, yeah. So, but but first you gotta have an understanding, right? So one of them is uh, when productivity per unit of labor goes up, mm -hmm. okay, what does that mean from an employer's perspective, right? If I'm hiring people and I can now get double the production out of You're a worker. You're hiring less people. Right, I can hire half as many people to produce the same amount. Right. Okay, so what you see is the number of jobs declines as productivity goes up. There's, now, so there's more competition for those higher paying jobs. Well, they're not necessarily higher paying jobs, just the jobs that remain. True. Right? You have more people competing for the jobs that are left, which means higher supply of labor and lower number of jobs. So you don't have to pay people as Correct. much because right. everyone's fighting for those jobs. Correct. Mm -hmm. This is why we talk about scarcity being one of the components to driving up value, right? Because when things are really scarce, you end up having to pay a premium to get it. Okay, but when there's not that many jobs and a lot of people are competing for them, then you can say, well, it's like a reverse option, right? Or sorry, reverse auction. Okay, like when everybody's competing for one thing and there's lots of buyers, the price goes up. But when there's lots of buy sellers of their labor and nobody's buying it, what happens? You have to start lowering to, and so this is the idea of like somebody bidding a job and the lowest bidder wins, right? That's really what's going on. It's the employer saying, I have a position and we're willing to fill it. Well, you do it for this little, mm -hmm. okay? And most people don't like to think of it that way. They think, well, that's wrong of the employer. And that seems like, it, it just depends well, on where you reality. land. Well, it, that's kind of my larger point, right? Is that we could sit here and sort of demonize employers as, well, that's dehumanizing and everybody's you know, screwing everybody else. Or we could say, well, there are natural forces at play in the market. And this is one of the consequences of globalization, right? 